Welcome back to the podcast. Gabe, Giannis, and I, we are rolling solo on today's episode and uh, just, you know, status on our life, what's going on, things that are on our mind. And Gabe, before we started recording, was talking about signing up for a marathon and um, his pursuit on uh, finding out more information about Ozempic. Now, are you thinking about taking it yourself, Gabe, or did you find out some, uh, <laughs> some <laughs> what, what's going on with Ozempic? What's happening here? <laughs> Fill us in. What is Ozempic? Dude, it is it is a fascinating world, a rabbit hole to go down to this whole Ozempic thing. I was listening to, I've, I've like read and like listened to a bunch of things. Cause how can you not read about this thing? Cause it's been everywhere, right? Like I feel like almost a year ago, it started popping up as like this, like, you know, like Hollywood, like people take it to lose weight. Like that's the first thing that I started hearing about it. Then it started coming up that this was like a big deal and really helping people lose weight and so on and so forth. And then it just like, I feel like it blew up and it's everywhere. And like, I feel like you can ask anyone and anyone, everyone at least knows someone who knows someone that's like tried it or used it. Do you know anyone that's like firsthand has used it? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I do. I know, yeah. I know multiple people. Firsthand. Yeah. And, and, and I never heard of it until they started talking about it. And, and, and the craziest thing is people are like, this is insane. It works. And yeah. yeah oh yeah. And it's interesting because like what I've heard is that people say that like, it shuts off like this, just like constant noise of like wanting food, wanting to snack. Like it just like there, it just completely turns that off. And now, interestingly enough, there's like cases for using it for like alcoholism and different types of addiction because it just like what it does. And again, I only know like what I've heard on a couple of podcasts by no means am I an expert, but like what it does is it like takes away the like psychological craving for it, like almost like rewires that it makes you not want the thing, crave the thing. So yeah, man, I mean, it's interesting, I think for us to have a conversation because <clears throat> obviously we're in the fitness space, right? Obviously we want to encourage people to train hard and work out and eat the right things and get the sleep. And that will lead to, you know, not only all the benefits that we talk about from like a mental health perspective and like leading by example and all those good things. But for a lot of people, you know, like it comes down to, they want to look a certain way. Like you work out because you want to fit into a certain type of clothes or you just want to show up a certain way. Like, I think that the, the physical benefits is definitely something that a lot of people think about. And now if you have this it's not a pill, it's an injectable, but if you have this drug that can get you there without having to do the uncomfortable hard work, you know, I think that I'm pretty much teeing you up here, but you know, are you missing out on 90% of the benefits? Because the benefits are from like getting into the gym and doing the work and like being consistent, having some discipline weeks in and weeks out to get there. But then again, and then I'll, I'll, I'm curious to hear your thoughts on the flip side you know, you can steel man the argument of, dude, there are people that are really struggling. Like there are people that like, yep. you know, 300 pounds, like just have tried everything and this can help them get to at least a healthier place to where then hopefully they start making the habit changes. But it's almost like, it's almost like a necessary like thing to get them moving in the right direction that will be healthier because, you know, being 200 pounds is better than being 300 pounds. And then from there, maybe they can get to a better place. And again, I know you're 215, so I'm using those numbers like, you know, arbitrarily, but you know what I mean? Yeah. Well, so I know three people that have publicly talked to me about Ozempic, like, and actually they've been on it. And out of the three people, one of those people, I think, I, I think, you know, in, in one person's case, it was done really well. And in the others, maybe not. So I think where it gets uh, taken out of context or maybe a negative is when you see like these Hollywood celebrities that are going from like, like, you know, looking pretty good to, to leaning out even more. And they're using this as a way to like cut weight or whatever. Right. Um, versus maybe someone who really needs this to break through that barrier. Like you're talking about Gabe, like maybe they're just been struggling, man. They've been struggling and they just need something to, to get them just, just some type of wins. They just need a win. And then that win will create a, you know, a hill that they could then start to like, you know, kind of go down, you know, in, in one person's case that I'll, I'll share is that th th what was required as taking this, this was a, a, about a little over a year ago. So it was like kind of Ozempic was newer, but, or maybe even longer than a year, probably a year was, um, it was requirement to also see a therapist to, to get this prescription for the Ozempic. 
And it was all part of like this plan where they're going to start you off on a really low dose. You're going to be working with a therapist and then they'll increase your dose over time as you continue with the therapy as well. And I thought that that was an interesting case because it started to really discuss, you know, the mindset that's involved around food and whatnot. But yeah, I guess my, the other, the other people that I'm talking about, they utilize this as a, as a, as a tool while also doing a lot of exercise and it's been super beneficial for their life. I guess what I don't know, and I'm not a doctor, right? But what are the negative side effects in the that. future, right? Yeah. What are the negative side effects? And then, you know, are you, what are you going to do? Are you going to do this for the rest of your life? Like, how does that work? I, because if it's blocking the receptors from like feeling hungry as much, are you just going to assume you're going to be there for the next 50 years of your life? How does that work? I, I don't know. I'm, I'm asking a serious question. Like, what did they say on the podcast you've been listening to? Well, that's the complicated piece. And so the guy, the, it's an episode on My First Million podcast that actually Matt Walker got me on. Shout out Matt Walker that I, I love. Those guys are super entertaining and they have a wide range of, of subjects, but everything always kind of boils down to business and entrepreneurship. I like that they always tie everything back to that. And the guy they have on essentially you know, his point of view is that this isn't good. Like this isn't good. And it's very, very few people that are on the extreme case of like, they really need help with something. And this is a better alternative than, you know, Mary baby, um, you know, like actual surgery or doing any, like it's better than that, but it should be reserved for the extreme, extreme cases. And the problem is that it's being peddled in many ways by like, big pharma or whatever you want to call it to even like, like kids now, because there are a lot of kids that are obese and it's like, you know, getting them started early and early that like everyone could benefit from this preventatively. And that's a really slippery slope because especially with kids, like you have plenty of time there to kind of mold their habits in a better way to get them in a better position. Like, I think it's, it's a step too far to say that a kid, even if he's technically overweight or obese has to go on this drug that to your point, like, are you going to use this forever? Like, if this is the thing that helps you not feel like you need food all the time, like, are you now signing up? Well, yeah, what's and the end game? I mean, maybe Liz can pull it up. Like, is, is Ozempic, like, if you get off of it, then do you regain those same habits, those same sensations? Yeah. So there've been a lot of studies now that have shown exactly that, that when people get off, they regain the weight because they haven't changed anything about their, like, their, their habits or what they do, they've just like rewired to not have those cravings. And if they don't have the thing there that's rewiring them to not have those cravings, lo and behold, you get the cravings back, you eat again, and boom, you're back at, at, at kind of square one. So okay. the case that the guy on the podcast is making is that this is all very, very bad overall. And that, you know, it's really, and it's funny because he brings up the whole seed oil things, but it's really like processed foods, seed oils, you know, processed sugars that we need to combat. But the problem I have with that argument is that like, obviously that's the issue, but like, it's easier said than done. Like at the end of the day, like, what are you doing to like, especially now that I have kids, right? Like I was just talking to a really close friend of mine in Denmark, actually. And he, so he, he's the CEO of, of Puri the company I used to work for. I still connect with him every now and then really good friend. And he's like, the healthiest guy ever, right? Like he is very serious about the food he eats, started this supplement company that has fish oil and magnesium. Like they take pride in like not having like, you know, heavy metals in their supplements. They do it right. Like love that brand, love what they do. And he now has kids that are three and four. And he was telling me about how like even knowing everything he knows and having the values that they have as a family, like you have your kids going to these birthday parties and it's like, cake and candy and like they get a little to go bag afterwards. And it's like, it's impossible to say no to all these things altogether. So it's like, how do you balance letting kids, especially young kids participate in some of these things without putting them in a position where they are going to have an unhealthy relationship with food or, or stuff like that. So it's just that that's an extreme example of what I think is like, it's easier said than done to say, Hey, you know, like processed sugars and processed foods are the enemy. Just like cut those out. Like that's not realistic for most people. It's not realistic to like do that no. for your kids. And I mean, especially someone that's been struggling for a really long time. I mean, Liz is pulling up something right here. New research shows the number of 12 to 25 year olds who used, who, who used diabetes and obesity drugs, such as Wegovy and Ozempic climbed from about 8,700 a month. <laughs> to 60,000 a month in 2023. 
overall in 2023, nearly 31,000 children aged 12 to 17 and more than 162,000 people aged 18 and 25 received the drugs. But uh, th- th- but they're including di- diabetes drugs, which I, I would I would imagine that's kind of, we're having two different conversations. No, 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 no. So, so that's the interesting thing. The thing is that Wigovi and Ozempic both are, were originally, at least my understanding, they were originally meant to treat diabetes. But- huh. Yeah, so they're originally diabetes. Oh, because because they're trying had, to have people not eat. Okay, right. Yes, right. so they, they were originally like, this is the diabetes drug. If you have diabetes, this is going to help you with their diabetes. Then what they found was that it was helping people not crave food that they shouldn't be eating. So that they were like, oh, what if we give this to someone that doesn't have diabetes? And it's like, oh, I don't have these cravings anymore. And you start losing weight. So that's the thing. It's these these medications were also made for something else. And now they're being used over here. And yeah, to your point that you were saying before, there's also a lot of people that are using it, not necessarily to be healthier, but because they're literally trying to go from a size two to a size zero or whatever. Well, yeah. Right? I mean, dude, it's like, it's like, Hey, you could exactly. I think that and with any of these things and I hope people are smartening up to this, I'm sure, I'm sure they are. Is that like, well, back to the kids thing. It's like, I think that you got to be really careful with those type of things. I got to find, find a balance. And as you become a parent, you'll have to work, find what works for you and your spouse. I think what Miranda said was pretty impactful. Like, hey, we're going to let you guys eat whatever when you're at other places, but inside our house, we're not going to have those things. I think that's a good like balance, right? Where you can show up to a party, you know it's a treat. It's kind of the way that we looked at video games for a really long time. I think that's a good balance. Like, because oftentimes there's a social pressure. Like, you don't want your kid to be the one who, like is the only person who can't, who doesn't eat the cake. You know, it's just like, dude, you're going to be fine. Like, but if you have a ton of that at the house, it can start to lead to something a little bit different. Right. But I think my big problem with Ozempic, and I don't know, uh, Liz, if you could pull up this data, I'm curious if there's an end game. Um, because I do think it provides a solution, um, that's better than gastric bypass or some of these other lap band surgeries. I have a lot of, um, uh, I'm I'm pretty familiar with those surgeries because we had some family members who have gone through that, and I think that this could be a much better alternative to something like that. But it's like, then when when does it stop, or do you just keep going? Like, that's one of the reasons why I haven't even been interested in getting on TRT. I've never done it because I don't want to start taking TRT, and then all of a sudden I got to be shooting myself up for the next fifty years. You know, like that's. Have you? Well, before we get to the TRT conversation, because I think that's in, interesting as well. Um, <clears throat> the other thing that I've read about Ozempic too is if people are eating less because they don't have the cravings, but they haven't added the habits of exercise, sure. specifically strength training, there's people that are like a lot of the weight they're losing, they're losing a lot of muscle mass as well. So the mm. thing is, if you go about this the right way, quote unquote, the right way, you start eating more whole foods you start working out, you start exercising, you're going to lose the weight that you're supposed to be losing. You're going to lose fat and you're going to maintain muscle because you're working out in the gym, you're lifting an external load, your bone density is getting stronger, all of these really good benefits. If you take this drug, and again, this is something that I've read, but it makes sense to me, you're going to like the number on the scale is going to go down, but that doesn't necessarily mean that you're losing the actual weight you want to lose. It could be that you're losing muscle, which you don't want to do. Yeah. It almost reminds me. I mean, have you ever seen that show Naked and Afraid? You ever seen that on Discovery Channel? <laughs> yeah. What a segue. <laughs> also, oh. what a ridiculous premise for a show. But yeah, I've seen it. Dude, I mean, these guys go out there and they're not eating basically anything. Oh, yeah. Yeah. For 21 yeah. days or 40 days if you're doing like a blog or what. And when you watch the way they look in the beginning towards when they look at the end, I mean, they just basically look, you know, malnutrition, like just they shrink, right? Because they don't have access to the same type of food. Um, Anyways, I I think with stuff like this, I hope that people are recognizing that it's not all rainbows and that they they need to evaluate what's the best decision for them and their family. And I I know, like I said, I know personally people that are doing it who recognize like the pros and cons, but still choose to do it. Right? It's like, hey, I'm gonna do this as a means to where I want to get to, and then I'm gonna you know try and maintain that or whatever it might be. Um, and maybe that works for them. And it's like, who am I to judge, right? I'm just, that's, if it works for them, great. It's just understanding the pros and cons thing is important. Just like TRT. It's like, dude, if you want to, if you want to, you know, get more jacked, like, let's go. But just realize <laughs> the pros and cons. <laughs> you want to get more jacked. I think before we like close the chapter on the Ozempic thing, I, I think that what I hope the biggest takeaway that maybe people take from this conversation or what I'd like to just put out there a little bit more is that there are so many more benefits to training and exercise than like making a number on the scale go down. I think that 
that's kind of what, what this boils down to, to me, because if your interest is literally to take like 180 on the scale and turn it to 160, there's a whole bunch of different ways that you can do that. Ozempic can get you there. However, if you want to feel better, improve your health, like clear your mind, have better energy levels, like have more bone density, have more muscle mass, be a more capable human being, right? Like one of the things we talk about being able to run, jump, swim, all of these things so that when the time calls, you're able to do that. You can't do that with a weekly injectable, like period. You have to put in the work, you have to train. And yes, as a byproduct, you might see the number on the scale go down. You might fit into smaller clothes. Like you might look better and have better confidence, but it's wrapped up in so many other good things that really only, only, only come if you do the work, not if you take the shortcut. Well, I mean, it reminds me of the Chris Hinshaw story we just had on the podcast. Oh, and dude. Yeah. <laughs> dude, you know, it's, uh, it's not funny. Actually, I shouldn't have said that. Um, what's, um, you know, powerful, I guess, the lack of a better term. We finished the podcast and we're still, um, we're, we're still on the, you know, call yeah. or whatever. And he's like, Jay, you made me cry in three minutes into this podcast. And I'm sitting there, I'm like, fuck. I was like, dude, I, I'm, I'm so sorry. Like in my mind, I'm like, dude, I'm so sorry. That was not my intention. But the story he was sharing was just so powerful and resonating with him. He hadn't thought about it in a long time. And Chris and I are, are really good friends. And so, um, you know, I, we've talked about a lot of stories and a lot of life lessons, but one of the stories he shares is that, you know, he was, he was at the beach and he, long story short, he saved this young girl's life and you'll you have, have to, to go back and that. listen to that. Episode. Yeah. Have to go yeah. back. If you go have. back and check out that episode. Um, but it, it goes back to this whole Ozempic thing. You know, if, if Chris was just taking Ozempic and not training, he wouldn't have been able to protect or provide or do any of the things that we talk about. And so I think that it could be a tool to be utilized, but let's not forget the benefits you get from training, all the benefits that we know, you know, and we talk about this a lot, but it's like, I think the way you look is, is only, you know, 20, I mean, maybe I'd say differently if I was in a different shape, but like only a fraction of the benefits you really get. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, for some people it's, it's the thing that I think you can more readily like see, like you can look in the mirror and see, Hey, this is working. Like I'm changing, yeah. right? Like you can't every week get a blood test and see where your blood markers are or whatever, like stuff like energy levels, mood. It's like a little bit gray. Like you can obviously tell if you're feeling better, but I think that the reason that the physical benefits are something that people, um, often cite as the reason they're doing this stuff is because it's just, it's there, it's in your face. It's like in the pictures you take, it's in the mirror every day when you look. So it kind of becomes what people get fixated on. Yeah. But I think it is important to see it as the secondary, not the primary. Yeah. And that's no, coming I, from I, someone that's literally working out just to get jacked. It's the only thing. I well, but yeah, that's, that's, <laughs> that's you're just all right, we're taking a quick break from the podcast to talk about what we have coming up on the Train Hard app in the month of July. So we're halfway through the year, which means that all the programs on the Train Hard app are entering a new training phase for the months of July, August, and September. So if you've been waiting, if you've been thinking about joining the Train Hard app, now is a great time to do it because we're turning the page on the first half of the year and going into brand new focuses. Force is going to be focused on building some raw strength in the back squat, the deadlift, and the bench press. We're also going to be working on developing some strength in some body weight movements, the pull up, the dip. So just a lot of really great strung, structured strength work, as well as the conditioning to make sure that you keep that engine going strong. So a lot of strength focus and force. So if you're trying to get strong this summer, absolutely something to check out. And then on the flex side, we have a brand new training phase as well. And that first six week cycle as part of that training phase is going to have a big focus on these giant sets. So five exercises per muscle group that you'll do in quick succession. So you'll do something like a bench press, then you'll do dumbbell bench press, then you'll go incline dumbbell bench press, then you'll do dips, and then you'll do push-ups back to back to back. The pump on these sessions is unreal. And I promise you i promise you if you're trying to build muscle if you've struggled to put on a little bit of weight this is going to be the way to do it this is going to be the way to improve your body composition i'm super excited and then the last thing is we now also have past cycles of flex available 
as an ebook. So if you're just not trying to download another app, you don't want to be on a monthly subscription, you can now access Flex specifically by going on the Train Hard shop and purchasing the ebooks for either just a six week cycle or the full first training phase of the year. So highly recommend checking that out. Highly recommend getting on the Train Hard app. Let's get strong. Let's get big. Now let's go back to the podcast. Man, so um, soon coming out, when this podcast release, it'll already be announced, but we are, um, we're doing another deaf reset and we're doing a summer deaf reset with Jocko fuel origin, uh, you know, the Jocko team and really excited about this. It's a one month, uh, program that, um, Gabe designed a week, a, a week B and it repeats and it's progressive overload and it's hypertrophy bodybuilding type training. And yesterday, uh, I filmed so many movements <laughs> and the way we had to do this and I don't know how they're going to edit this, but dude, I'm in my tank top and I was just like, I was so drenched, man, because basically as part of the video, they wanted me to actually do the full sets. And, um, so that was my day of, uh, of filming yesterday. So if you guys see this come out to the deaf reset, all of that is real. I did the workouts. Um, and we have some really good workouts coming your way. Um, if you guys want to check out, um, the deaf reset and flex in particular with this bodybuilding program that, that Gabe put together. Yeah. If you, if you've been on the train hard app or purchased one of the eBooks and you've been following flex, it's going to be very similar training to what you've seen. If you haven't, it's a great way to get a taste of what that program looks like and, and take something that's a little bit different than maybe, you know, the usual high intensity training, cross your training. And again, I always like to say that, like, that doesn't mean that this training is going to be easy. It's not, you film the workouts, like this is really tough training, but it's such a nice change of pace to like it not be so much about how fast can I get this done? Three, two, one, go. How many reps can I get done? But like, how focused can I be on like the actual muscle group that I'm working on here to make it work so that I can either get stronger or build muscle there. And it's fun because it was the first time that I programmed it to have a full body split. So while I personally prefer, and maybe I'll change my mind once I actually test this cycle out, um, and actually take it through its paces, but I personally prefer like, Hey, today's chest day. I'm doing chest. I'm doing triceps like that body group is going to get absolutely torched. I'm going to feel a little sore tomorrow and it feels like I did really good work. This is actually a full body split where every day you're going to be touching an upper body push, an upper body pull, some sort of squat and some sort of hinge. Um, so the goal is that hopefully you're never after one session, like, Hey, my chest is destroyed. My legs are destroyed, but you can actually hit everything every single day and feel like you got a full body workout. So yep. something a little bit different, a good way to get a taste for what that training looks like. And honestly, the thinking behind a full body split and a lot of people that are big proponents of it is that because you don't get as beat up every day in one particular area, you can actually do more meaningful work throughout the course of the week because you're never beat up. Like you're hitting the chest every single day. And yes, you're doing it hard when you're doing it, but you're not doing so much volume that you can't back that up the next day and the next day and the next day. And so cumulatively, you get you a lot get of more. really good work done. Whereas if you do chest all day Monday, some would argue that by the third exercise or fourth exercise, that muscle group is so exhausted that yes, you're able to do the reps and it feels hard and you have a pump, but you're not pushing it as hard as you should be to actually make growth and strength happen. So that's kind of the thinking. Um, I think it's a really, really fun two weeks of programming that again, the beauty of it is you repeat it two or three times and you get a four week, six week cycle where you can kind of add a little bit of weight or a little bit of volume every time you see a session repeat itself because progressive overload is kind of like the king of making the adaptation happen. So really excited for people to check that out in the summer reset. Um, really appreciate you up. filming all those videos. <laughs> I know that was Dude, not easy. Well, no, some of the movements. So I will say, um, yesterday, because I was doing a lot of these movements, um, some of them are like very traditional, right? Like supinated grip, uh, bicep curls, those are a little, you know, boom out, right. Just really hitting it. Hammer curl. All right. Got it. You know, bench press. Okay, cool. But then all of a sudden you start talking about up down gorilla rows. Oh, and or is it up down? No, up top bottom, top top bottom, bottom top bottom gorilla row and top bottom bench. Dude, I'm telling you, that was a solid combo. So what a top bottom bench press looks like is you'd be laying down, you'd have both arms extended, you'd pull one arm down, go back up, pull one arm down, go back up, and you'd repeat that. But then for the top down 
gorilla row, you are holding both dumbbells at your chest and then touching the ground one, touching the ground the other. Dude, that one just lit me up. I hope I filmed it right, but it lit me up. Yeah, no, that those are fun combos, man, because now you have the movement, but you're also like holding the 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 position. Um, right. So yeah, dude, it, there's some, there's some gnarly mixes and the fact that you filmed. So for anyone that eventually watches the videos and does the summer reset, which hopefully all you guys are doing, Jason filmed all 10 of those in one day, because that's when the filming team went out there to do it. So when you're like, ah, this is hard. Just remember you're only doing one workout a day, not 10. Yeah. I hope they have some B roll in the background. Just like <laughs> me, just get my, my, my kids show up and I'm, I'm, I just, it was like uh you know, how many hours later and my son had one of those liquid deaths, you know, those drinks, like a, he yeah. had a lemon lime liquid death. And I just like grab it. I'm like, Kata, can I please have this? And it just was like the perfect, you know, the, the, the perfect drink, but Hey, uh, why before, you pick, before yeah. we move on from that, I have to tell them the story also of, so Jason's filming these 10 workouts and he texts me because you filmed one movement a little different than the other, but it's not a little difference. It's a big difference. So for one of the leg days, the last like movement in the, I think it's three, three exercises in a row is jumping air squats. And if you've ever done jumping air squats at the end of like some weighted lower body movements, dude. It is gnarly. And Jason filmed it as jumping jacks. And so I was like, dude, you have to. In my to defense, do it jumping jacks do, do come up. I know they do come up. Time. They do come up. They do come up. And also in your defense, you're like filming like 10 videos. Like there's a lot going on. I'm not giving you a hard time here. I'm just like, it's a I mean, now I think we can laugh about it, but I can only imagine you filming these 10 workouts and then having to go back and refilm one because one movement was off. So I appreciate you doing that, but man. That's a solid day of fitness right there. Oh, solid day of fitness. It's all good. I um yeah, so dude, why did you uh so speaking of solid day of fitness, um and I still have not made my decision on this high rocks and dropping. No, I made the decision like I'm I'm doing it, but I I don't know if I want to cut maybe I need those Zempic. Um to- <laughs> <laughs> it all comes full circle. It all goes- tries a Zempic to train for high rocks. <laughs> I think a Zempic to, to get my marathon down down or or <laughs> oh, that's going to make the clip. I love it. Uh, so, so, you know, cause I haven't seen under 200 pounds on a scale of my, you know, basically my adult life. And, uh, you know, Hinshaw is telling me that what I'm going to gain like a second, every pound or whatever it is. Um, but why did you decide to do uh Dallas or, um, Houston instead of Austin Houston instead of Austin? Yeah. So I set my eyes on doing a marathon or Marathons in Texas tend to be in like January or February, not fall, which is when most marathons are because it's still so hot here in the fall. But I was going to do Austin since, you know, I'm stone's throw by stone's throw. I mean, an hour. I'm an hour away from Austin. Houston's like three hours away. But I was reading reviews on the course and Austin's apparently like a, a pretty hard course. Like it, it's it's pretty hilly, which you wouldn't really? be. Yeah. Yeah. You wouldn't think so. Um, and I've been in Austin and I'm like, what hills, but apparently it's a pretty hilly course. So for my first marathon, cause I've never run a marathon before. And I also have a very specific time goal that I'm trying to hit. I was like, let me yeah, see you if there's any- yourself up for success as much as possible. Yeah. I think it being my first, I read that Houston is like a super flat marathon course. So anyway, I'm when are you Houston. doing it? It's on my birthday weekend, which will be fun just in general. So it's January 19th. My birthday. Oh, so bro, you're going to be on the flattest course possible in, in pretty cold weather. Won't it be kind of cold then? Dude, hopefully. Texas, you'd never know. In January, you still get some like weird like 70, 80 degree days, which for running a marathon is pretty hot. What's you your want- goal time? Oh, man. All right. So like sub three is like would be awesome. But I, I mean, think it's- I got to do some math here. It's 650. 650, 650 for 23 miles? 24. Well, no, 26, 26.4. 26.2 or whatever? 26.2. <laughs> we both got it wrong so many times. <laughs> it's 26.2. It's 26.2. And um, you want to and you want to go sub seven minute mile pace for 26 sub, miles. The thing is like a three, there's a whole reason that Nick Bear made a whole series and it became like this huge thing for him to break a three-hour marathon. Three hour marathon's like the the standard in marathon running. It's like you either are running marathons to finish marathons or you're running marathons to like 
fucking run marathons. And the three hour line is like a big, big, big deal. So that's kind of like my super, anyone listening to this as a, that, that's a runner is probably making fun of me, like running my first marathon sub three, but that's like my super ambitious goal. I think I would be very disappointed if I can't get below three thirty. And now that's a huge, huge gap, but, um, I, I'm shooting for under three hours. But I mean, it is and it isn't, right? I mean, when you say three hours to 3.30, I mean, that's like a minute, a mile. I mean, it's I like guess that's like- uh, that, That's a big deal. That's a big deal, I guess. Yeah, that's a big Wait, deal. Here we go. Um, let's see what Liz pulls up. She says, a 3.30 hour marathon pace about eight minutes per mile for the entire 26.2. Oh, we actually all, didn't I just say 26.4? I think we all butchered it, but <laughs> um, So dude, I mean, that's not, that's that's reasonable. I think you should be able to do that. That I, yeah, yeah. That's why I'm going to aim for three and you know, we'll, we'll, we'll see what happens. That's pretty fast. Um, but I'm trying to bank on the fact that, and we've talked about this on the podcast before, like that's the benefits of like really putting deposits in the bank early on because this stuff does come back. And I was an endurance athlete all of my life. Like I swam long distance and like not, not only did I swim, I wasn't a sprinter. Like I swam the mile and the 800 I did triathlons for a really long time. I ran cross country. And yes, I haven't done that in, in years. Honestly, I haven't. I've done, I did CrossFit for a while and then I've been doing this kind of bodybuilding stuff, but I'd like to think that that stuff is still there. And if I do the work to just kind of like get back to it and get my legs comfortable enough with doing the mileage and, and, and have a really good structured training plan, it's not like I'm like, oh, I've never, you know, done anything endurance in my life. And I'm trying to run my first marathon sub three. I'd like to think that, you know, everything that I put in the endurance engine cardiovascular bank throughout my life, I can kind of like tap back into it now, which I don't know, maybe is super aggressive. Maybe it isn't, but you know, it's, it's, it'll be fun to find out. Well, what, what, what'll be fun, what'll be interesting to find out is like, so I was with Nick Bear the other day and dude, he's an example of a guy. He's like two, you know, he's, he's, he's a little bit taller, but he's like two fifteen or two twenty or whatever he weighs. And he's running like what did he run? His what did he run the the marathon in? Do you remember the the? He's Calvary? up to. I mean, I think he's already done it a sub two forty. So he ran, he ran a marathon without really kind of training much and did like a three fifty something. Then he like tried to do it again and got four fifteen. Um, and this was when he was like not really training and he was just like thought he could like will himself to run a marathon. And then he did the whole training series where he broke the three hour marathon. He did a 256, but I think now he's down to a 230 something, which is like absolutely insane for how big of a guy he is. Huh? Nick bear runs a 230, 230 marathon. 39. So what's interesting about that is that, is that, um, he's been able to maintain, like he's, he's a pretty big guy. Like when I, when I was with him, like he's not a small guy. And so it'll be interesting to watch you because you've been working so hard to gain size and now, you know, to be able to, it'll be interesting to watch your blend of, you know, incorporating like some flex bodybuilding with some longer, long, long distance and what happens to your physique, um, yeah. will be fun to watch. And so, so I'm going to take this opportunity to throw a feeler out here to the, uh, podcast audience. You guys can email me info at th.fit. If you'd be interested in like a flex hybrid type of program where it would be, it would still be flex. So flex right now is five training days a, a, a week, but something that would be like two to three training days with then two to three running days that would, that would be programmed in a way. Cause that's, I've always wanted flex. I've always programmed flex as exactly what I do. Uh, right. And I think that that's going to have to pivot a little bit, but I'm going to keep obviously programming flex because there's a bunch of people that love that program. I love hearing about it. But if I do end up having to obviously bring back what I'm doing in the gym to like two, three solid days, I think is what it's going to have to be to kind of like support and allow for all the running. I'm curious if anyone out there would be interested in that and what like a blend of running and the flex program could look like where it's two or three days of the main flex program that I, I handpick, like, Hey, do these days, if you're only going to do two or three and then have the running to kind of support it. Let yeah, me know. I, mean, I think it would be like a three day a week, uh, bodybuilding program and then a three day a week running program per perhaps. Yeah. Um, yeah. That, that, that's what it would be that I think 
anyone that just wants to run a little could benefit from. I think that once I'm in like the middle of like a marathon prep, for me, it's going to probably have to be more like two to three days in the gym and honestly like five to six running days. There's going to be some days where like you do going to be running and that with yeah. like significantly less volume, but it's going to be important to do that because if I'm not doing that, at least to maintain the muscle is going to go out the window. Well, I mean, dude, it's cool that you signed up for the marathon, you know, so I have, um, I went out to the sheriff's department the other day and I was shooting at 500 yards, which felt good because that's, it's hard to find places, especially in California to shoot 500 yards. And then to shoot that with a, with a, with an AR, like a, with a traditional, you know, AR rifle, what was you going to say? Well, I was going to say, do you know what the shooting uh, like demands of the tactical games are going to be? It, it, you're you're going to have less. Up, to, up to 500, I think. So, okay. but you don't know shooting, like exactly what that's no. going to look like. Okay. It's kind of like the CrossFit games where you don't really know. So I was shooting a silhouette. So, it, you know, decent sized target, right? Yeah. A silhouette yeah. from 500 yards. But what I didn't realize is like the grain of the, um, how the grain of the actual bullet makes a difference because since the beginning, when I've been shooting longer range, people are always like, Oh, you know, what's your, what's, what's the drop going to be? Um, and you know, Hey, what, what ammo are you using? Uh, I'm like, dude, why does it matter about the ammo? Like, he's like, no, no, what, what ammo are you, are you zeroed at? And it's like, Oh, but the ammo becomes a difference because of the, the, like the actual, and then they have ones that are more expensive, less expensive. And so what I've been really trying to do. So wait, is, is it because, is it the lower grain, the more drop? it's going to have because it's it must be something flying. like that. that yeah, that's yeah. what i would imagine i know nothing about this but i'm assuming that because the grain is the the amount of gunpowder in it right yeah so i'm assuming the less it has we should probably look this up instead of yeah, like, talking Liz, out of our asses Liz, but. Because, well, no, <laughs> but these bullets that i'm using um i actually got them from uh Okay. In general, lighter bullets have a flatter trajectory and drop less than heavier bullets. For example, 150 grain um, Winchester ballistic silver tip bullet. Wow. Drops, 30 six, wow. drops seven inches in 300 yards while it's- so you have to, it's, Yeah, because you have to take account. Seven to three inches is- You have to take account in how much that stuff is going to drop. Well, 7.3 inches at 300 yards and then 7.9 inches if it's at 180 grain. So the reason why this is a big oh. issue, what, what I've been told, I'm still like diving into this world- is that once you get past 300 yards, like things start to really matter. Sure. And I noticed that. So like I was shooting at 300 and doing burpees, 300 doing burpees. And then I have a one by eight optic. So I was like, it just, there's a lot of factors and I'm excited to dive more into it. But the reason why I brought up the tactical games is not because of talking about the grain, which obviously just through this, I needed to educate myself on more, <laughs> but it's more about the fact that I'm signed up in September for that. Right. And then in November for a high rocks with you, and then you have your January marathon. And it's just a good example of, you know, finding things in your life that you could train towards. And we share that on this podcast. I think it's, it's inspiration for other people to identify what seems cool to them. You know, like maybe it's a bodybuilding tournament competition. Maybe it's a powerlifting competition. Maybe it's just some type of like challenge, like our buddy, uh, Matt Olson, shout out to Matt Olson sent us a message this morning. He's like, Hey, on a 30 minute running clock, go run a mile and then see how heavy of a deadlift your power clean and your bench press, bench press mm -hmm. can be the it's like maybe it's something like it. that. Right. Yeah. But it's like finding different challenges. I think is cool just to, to keep you fired up. And he actually said something and I love this guy, Matt Olson. He's the best, but he said something to us. He said, uh, what do you say? He said, no more mediocrity for us dads, we need challenges like we were kids and keep going. I like that. Hell yeah, man. That's one of the the beauties from that CrossFit brought to so many people, right? Because whether it was the open or like local comps, I feel like that was the first exposure a lot of people got. Cause I was I was always I went straight from like swimming collegiately and having a season there and building towards something there to finding CrossFit and doing that stuff. But I know for a lot of people, they go, you go a span in your life where maybe you played sports in college, but then like and done, you're, you're not training for something specifically. And I do think that the fact that all these competitions and stuff became so popular and now stuff like high rocks becoming super popular and honestly running, becoming cool again, it's been, you know, that that's been really, really interesting for me because I, I also listened to this on, on a podcast and Nick bear is actually a huge kind of like figurehead in this space, but for a long time, like running was kind of lame. Like when I was in the endurance community and I ran, worked at a running shop and I did triathlons, like the people that ran were like, you know, the kind of like dorkier, skinnier guys. Like, you know, it was, it was, 
it, it wasn't a thing that you were like, especially like I remember in high school, like, you know, oh, like kids that ran cross country, country you yeah, know, yeah, cross yeah, country yeah, team. Yeah. And I and and I'm saying this as someone who ran cross country, so I'm I'm talking shit on myself, but like literally it was like, oh, like the nerds run cross country. And now I feel like the fact that like Nick Bear, you look at Thomas DeLauer, he's another great example. Like these guys that are just like I think it's they look the part, dude. They look exactly jacked. like they look the there's part. aspirational aspects of that, right? But for a long time, the the thing is the the narrative out there was that you can't have upper body muscle and run marathons or run fast or be a good runner. You just can't. You have to be skinny and just get miles in and so on and so forth. And I appreciate that these guys have been such big figureheads and like, no, you can do both. Like this whole hybrid athlete thing is like a thing because they've proven that it's a thing. Like they've proven it that they can, what's this? This month, Strava releases annual year in sport with fascinating insights about where running might be headed. Running was the most uploaded sport in 2023. Dude, running is making a big, big comeback. I am telling you. like, But I can see why that's true too because the, the barrier to entry is super low. Um, but, but, but for a while, and I don't know if some of this too was, you know, maybe like COVID and and a lot of people started running oh, yeah. because it kind of became a thing that you could do. Um, so maybe that had something to do with it, but it's definitely like, you can see that there's like, there's like more people getting into running again. It's funny. The pendulum always swings, right? Like I feel yeah. like running was huge. And then it was like, everyone was doing like CrossFit and Spartan races and whatever. And now it's like running, like traditional running trail running too, is having a huge, um, huge popularity, uh, you know, people doing these trails and ultra marathons and stuff. So it's cool, man. It's, it's, it's been fun to dive back into the world. We need um, to get an ultra marathoner on here, um, on the podcast, but I, I think, you know, look, I'm getting inspired more and more. I think the high rocks is a good way for me just to get in smiles without like going crazy. I'm excited for you on your journey with, uh, you know, the marathon. Um, I, I, I might do one at some point, but right now I think the High Rocks is a good inspiration. I, and I'm fired up for the the Flex running hybrid program, dude. I think that that's really true because guys also like, they want to be able <laughs> to run. Me, let me yeah. clarify. I haven't committed to anything. People should email me in though if they want to see it. I, okay, I want to well, see how many emails we get. I'm committed. I, I, I'm, <laughs> I'm not committing for you. I'm saying like I'm excited <laughs> for you. Um, but uh, hey, man, um, today's episode a little shorter than usual. Let um, me ask you a really quick question, though, be before we get on that. Do you have any BJJ competition plans? I feel like wh no, where, where is that on the uh, on the agenda? Full, just full, full, like transparency. Give me the full um, transparency. I'm I'm it's a couple of things. One is I want to build up my hedge more at brown belt. It's a mm -hmm. big gap between purple belt and brown belt. So I need to be able to build my hedge up a little bit. And then the other is when I start really training for a competition in jiu-jitsu, the risk of me getting injured starts to increase uh -huh. because I have a different mindset towards it, right? Like I'm really trying to like actually win. Um, and I just have a lot of physical things that I want to do right now that I don't want to put myself at that type of risk. That makes sense. Like I'll go into the gym and I'll throw down, of course. But um, when you start competing, that's a little bit of a different beast. So no, no, no jujitsu on the on the current docket, but that's not to say that uh, there isn't something coming up in the future of, of 2025. Love it. Love it. Well, hey, as per usual, guys, we really appreciate you listening to the podcast. Email info at th.fit if you want to see what Gabe has underneath the hood of his uh, running flex program. And, uh, you know, look, if you go back, check out the other episodes, the Hinshaw episode, the Spieler episode. Uh, we got Bear coming on. Dude, we, got, we have so many great episodes go back check them all out because i'm guaranteeing they're going to provide you some value we really appreciate you guys and make sure to keep training hard